Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the scientist. My name is Akram and today I have Victor as my guest in the podcast. Victor is a senior researcher scientist at Mercury Corporation. He's a Kyrgyzstani born multidisciplinary researcher and creative technologist focused on spatial and social computing, human computer interaction, immersive media, computational creativity and digital art. If that sounded complicated, don't worry about it. He will explain everything as well as talk about making human cyborgs and his research being closely related to science fiction. So subscribe and follow if you haven't already. I have a long list of people with interesting stories about research and about science and by subscribing or following you will help me keep uh, the show going. So without further ado, let's get to the podcast. Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today. This is the Scientist Podcast, and today we're with, we are with Vector. So, how are you doing, Vector? Uh, good. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm I'm good too. I'm glad that we finally were able to talk after <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this it's, long it's, time. It's been a while. <laughs> right? So, yeah, let's not take any longer time and just, can you introduce yourself a little bit to us? Um, yeah, uh, hi, uh, my name is Vector. I'm uh, originally from uh, Kyrgyzstan, Central Asia. Uh, I've been... Uh, living in Japan for, for well, about nine years, I guess it's been a while. Uh, I did my uh, grad school here, uh, masters and PhD. Um, and oh, you I, did your masters in here too? <clears throat> yeah, and I did my undergrad uh, back back at back at home in Kyrgyzstan. Um, I'm I'm working in uh, well, I, I guess I'll kind of people like to call it IT, even though it's not really the right term for it. Uh, I work in uh, <laughs> yeah. computer science. I'm a scientist, uh, and I also have a background as a software engineer. I used to work in the industry. Um, I, I work mean, on a lot of yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I saw your CV, and I was like, I, I don't even know how, what do these things mean, you know? So, c- can you tell me a, a little bit about like what you do actually? Like, uh, we're going to go back to your studies, but t- tell me about your job right now. What what is it that you do? Uh, right at this moment, I'm kind of working in uh, several positions. Uh, one is um, working at uh, Mercari R4D. It's a, a research division within the uh, Mercari Corporation where, um, <clears throat> I mean, you can check out our, our website. We're kind of doing like uh, long-term uh, research. Um, and I'm basically running the uh, ACI team or human computer interaction where we're studying uh, how people can um no, like basically, we're finding novel ways of how people could interact with uh, Mercari content, and um, yeah, right now we're working on accessibility. For instance, like uh, you could check out some of the studies that we made public, like uh, studies on uh, well, people with low vision disabilities who are using like C two C marketplace, etc. Um, <clears throat> I'm also working uh, at the University of Tsukuba right now. I, I I was a postdoc until March. Now I'm a visiting researcher. Nice. Uh, since since I moved to industry uh, full time uh, last year, and uh, yeah, I'm, right now I'm mostly just kind of like in an advisory role, just doing this kind of like organizational stuff for workshops and stuff. Sometimes I help students with a project, uh, but we're mostly working on like augmented virtual reality, kind of like futuristic technologies. Cognitive reality? What what is that? Uh, you know, no, no, no. Aug- augmented virtual reality. Augmented virtual reality. Okay. Augmented <laughs> slash virtual reality. Okay. <laughs> yeah, co- cognitive reality is not so far though. I mean, uh, like there is there was a lot of. Uh, I, like, mean, I, uh, I heard the the word somewhere i just don't know maybe <laughs> what it meant I, I mean there is a lot of like a brain computer interface uh work that is being integrated into a rvr right now so you're maybe already it's going to be... you're already blowing my head away i i don't get most of what you're saying so let, let's take it back a little bit like maybe start with the easier things to talk about so you said like you came to japan to do your masters and phd right right so after finishing your master's, what got you to, like you said, like, okay, I'll, I'll continue and <laughs> do another PhD because <laughs> the decision to continue with PhD is, I don't know how come people think of that one. Yeah. 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 I, I think about it too. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it's, it's, uh, so this, the situation when, uh, like I was finishing my master's, so I came here on max scholarship. 
And uh, by the end of my master, so before coming to Japan, I used to work in the industry. I graduated with my bachelor's only like, like I came to Japan in 2013, I graduated in 2012. So it's like almost like a no gap, but I started working uh, long before I graduated. So I was already working for some time. Um, so when I was finishing my master's, I was thinking, should I go back to like being a programmer? Or do I want to kind of like, uh, you know, pursue something more creative? Uh, was, because after all, like doing science is, is more about satisfying your curiosity. Um, so on... Your background is, is IT, is, is, am I correct? Um, or... Well, it's a software engineering computer science. I'm a mobile developer by trade, uh, but mm -hmm. it, these days I'm kind of more of a bit of everything, uh, as most <laughs> developers are. Uh, okay. You know, there's technology changes so rapidly, you just kind of like you have to uh, kind of grab. Catch up uh, with, try to yeah. catch up maybe. Yeah, it's kind of sometimes like it's usually what what was the name for it? like DevOps, like people who are doing like a bunch of stuff. Uh, but uh, yeah, I hadn't been to actually I hadn't been to industry for a while uh, as an engineer, so I might be telling you the wrong thing right now. But uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I was thinking like, sh should I go or and at the same time, like uh, Max kind of offered me like, hey, you know, we can also pay for your PhD if you want to stick around. Um, so that was not in your original plans. Yeah, I, originally I, I wasn't sure if I want to do like PhD uh, full time because honestly, like I was always like kind of like practical, uh, kind of like a application side person. Uh, I, I like tinkering, like I like, you know, hacking, like making, you know, prototypes or things that you could use. Uh, but I wasn't really like into, you know, fundamental science aspect of my work. Um, and PhD is, is usually about the kind of like fundamental contribution. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's about knowing a lot about a very small thing. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's usually <laughs> yeah. like you need to kind of like dive really deep into, into the thing, like to the very, very basics of it. Um, so yeah, I wasn't sure, but, uh, I, I was offered. An opportunity and at the time i guess job market wasn't working so well it was around 2014 i guess 2014 15. um yeah and i was just i couldn't find like a good job options in japan uh, and i figured well we'll give phd a go why not uh, <laughs> yeah because you know it's being paid and you yeah. know if i if i'm if i get tired of it i could you know back out uh, and maybe go back into the industry yeah, and somehow I stuck around. Like I, I got really excited about the topic I applied for, and uh, on 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 the go, I found more people to work with, and I just kind of got excited about my work. So, in PhD, usually research is complicated, but can you dumb it down for me? <laughs> can you make it uh, easy to understand? Elevator pitch of my PhD thesis would be something like, uh, you know, like you and me right now are talking over Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so imagine if I uh, had to like uh, call you and uh, ask you to grab something within your room, for example. Uh, that would be kind of a you know kind of an annoying process because I need to verbally explain you where to look at and where to go, and the image is mirrored. Um, and uh, so that's why I was kind of wondering about how we can um, make this process much easier by, uh, for instance, using 360 video. So like both people have the view of the same room in 360 at the same time, and they have different tools for uh, kind of like annotating the room. So you could like draw around the room or you could uh, like point uh, the person towards something. And at the same time, you can also share what, what you're seeing in real time. Um, Okay, it's getting complicated. Uh, all right. I, I uh, think I'm starting to understand. Maybe, maybe I'm not pretty sure yeah, that so I did it. But... It's kind of the yeah. it's it's a uh, it's an idea that comes from uh, the topic of telepresence, or being uh, you know tele means remotely presence yeah. being present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and and yeah, and it's kind of like coming from idea. Okay, how we can more efficiently calibrate towards the distance, and how we can calibrate in spatial. By spatial, I mean, you know, 
Uh, being in a... Yeah, you're being in a room. Yeah. How can I remotely collaborate you in such a way that it would feel like I was together with you in the room and telling you what to do? Uh huh. That that's that's what we see in in like in movies in the future or whatever. Like when you well, talk to somebody yeah. and they're like basically in that room and yeah, like uh, how can I say like communicating and reaching to everybody yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, like a virtual avatar kind of thing. Virtual avatar. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for yeah. <laughs> thank you for putting the words. Yeah. Yeah. I, my my research in the field I'm working on is very closely related to science fiction. It's usually there's kind of like an interaction between the two, like a lot of uh, famous researchers I, I know and I work with are big fans of science fiction. Um, for instance, in Japan, uh, there's a very famous uh, scientist, uh, Jun Rikimoto, is a head of uh, Sony CSL, and uh, he has his own laboratory, very famous at Tokyo University. Uh, he's a huge fan of William Gibson. He actually he even met the guy and talked about, you know, uh, all this stuff like he named i think half of his project after like gibson's books and this kind of things can you so. can you give us uh, who is william gibson uh hey, william forgive, gibson forgive my uh, ignorance <laughs> is uh one of the first authors who kind of coins the genre of cyberpunk he started uh writing in about in i think 70s uh he uh like he's famous for such work as like neuromancer uh was Mona Lisa Overdrive, Johnny Mnemonic was like, there was a movie about it like in, in the 90s with Keanu Reeves. I feel I feel uh, so ashamed that I don't know about it, even though I like yeah, he's, cyberpunk. Uh, yeah, he's, he's kind of like the person who uh, pioneered a lot of concepts that you see right now in, in science fiction, like cyberspace, you know, this whole hacker culture kind of thing. So a lot of people were really inspired. Another one I, I recommend checking out is Neil Stevenson. Uh, he's, he's another guy who's uh, pioneered a lot of things. He, he used to be, um, or maybe still is, uh, uh, like a um, elite futurist at Magic Leap. Uh, I'm not sure where he's working right now, but uh, he also, like, very, very, very famous, very interesting work. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to give him, a, <laughs> to, to check him out, because... If for for everybody that is watching or listening, like me and Victor met through photography, and we both like the cyberpunk genre, so I, well, I feel, uh, I, I feel, yeah, yeah. I, I come from more like a appreciation of cyberpunk genre from mm -hmm. you know early age, uh, even before that. Like the, yeah, yeah, like the like the future stuff. Uh, I used to like read books, uh, watch you know anime is also like famously lots of cyberpunk stuff in there. Um, if you don't like reading books, but you like graphic novels, uh, I recommend my favorite comic is Transmetropolitan. Uh, I think if you, if you like Hunter Thompson and, and you like cyberpunk genre, it's like really, really uh, an enjoyable read. I'll, I'll go for it. I think I also downloaded a few audiobooks <laughs> about cyberpunk. I think one of them is called 1919. What was the book? Oh. 1984 <laughs> 1984 was it 1984 no no that That's was George Orwell. It, i know 1984 <laughs> was, was when was i born so i was like no there's no way I was, <laughs> it was that one but no, no, no. anyway so there there is a book that is titled with the year and it's uh about cyberpunk and how the writer how did he imagine the world in the, during that time so I should check it out. It, it sounds I'll, interesting. I'll, I'll give it a... I'll, I'll try to remember its name too. So, okay. Uh, we went a little bit into the rabbit hole there. So, uh, I, I have a few rabbit questions. Rabbit hole is technically, you know... Okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't know. So, okay. Uh, yeah. What, d during your PhD, like you said, like you did not really plan to do that PhD, but... The circumstances well, were in but, favor of yeah, but by, it, by right? plan I mean like some people you know when they're studying grad school they're like and then I'm going to take a PhD is going to be three, three to five years and a postdoc and a professor yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> they yeah. have like the whole career lined up but, you know right now I even see some undergraduate students who have like huh. full paper publications under their belt at, at like second or third year undergrad. I'm like, oof. Yeah. <laughs> oof. The competition <laughs> is, yeah. that is tough. Those people yeah. are like, they, they are definitely, you know, have their PhD planned ahead. I was not like that when I was applying. 
Well, but you, you still like you the way I see it. Like uh, you did not plan it, plan for it, but it the op- when the opportunity op- offered itself to you, you took full advantage of it, and you kind of you made something great out of it, right? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, as much as uh, I could give into the opportunity. <laughs> okay, so regarding that PhD time, what was the most fun thing? What was the most fun experience that you had during your PhD? Um, Or was it all horrible? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Like a, a lot of uh, PhD students kind of complain about, about the experience. If you, if you go to Twitter, there's like a hashtag academic chatter. Yes, yes, I... I, I Man, yeah. I, I I didn't have, I can't, it's not about me, but let's talk about you. But I did not have a lot of fun during my PhD anyways. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of common experience that the PhD experience is pretty grueling. Uh, it, same for me. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't easy. Uh, when I was when I was getting it, it, it I was kind of wasn't realizing what, what, what you know, what, what, what awaits, uh, you know, what, how it's going to be for me. Because uh, it, it, you know, when when you're not, uh, you, you when you're not kind of like a fully academic person, as in, I mean, you're not used to this kind of academic lifestyle, and the you don't really understand how it works. Uh, it it feels very different for you. You know, when you're coming from, like from bachelor's or master's, you're like, well, I'll you know I'll write a diploma and I'll get my diploma, and you know, it's done. Yeah, it's. And Pretty when you try to, yeah, when you try to apply that thinking to PhD, you're in for a bad time. <laughs> yeah, because because it's a completely different. Kind of I almost program. spit my tea. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's a, but it's a completely different experience, right? Because uh, yeah, PhD is more like preparing you for being like a full time professional academic, rather than just kind of you know asking you to write a diploma. And uh, a lot of times, people like me included like have this different kind of like concept when getting into it <clears throat> so so was there anything fun like um, well okay so <laughs> at, the at fun least part, mention one part one part that was fun the, the fun part was honestly yeah. um my research really took off when i starting started engaging with the community uh because when uh I was kind of studying in a small school, so there was not a lot of people interested in AR. Uh, and but when I started going to conferences, started volunteering for conferences, and uh, engaging with the community, I felt that well, first of all, it was very encouraging. Like I saw that you know a lot of projects they have the right to be published, you know, because sometimes like you try to publish in one or two places, you get like really terrible comments, and, and really discourages you because you're like oh my god this is the worst uh but when you actually go to the conferences <laughs> yeah. and you see all sorts of like uh, i'm not saying like all sorts of bad papers being published, but like all sorts of like different contributions being published mm. that are not you know necessarily extremely scientific or extremely fundamental mm-hmm. as the reviewers would ask you to be uh you kind of get a perspective and once you get engaged with the community you also get some access to like mentorship Uh, mm-hmm. Or at least some kind of like uh, opportunities that per, w- just would not be available for you if you were just sitting in your school. And uh, I mean, <clears throat> at, uh, also learning from other people over there, like seeing the different types of maybe posters or presentations, like opens your mind to different yeah. kind of things that you might not have, you know, immediately thought of if you were by by yourself, right? Yeah. So that for me was kind of like. The most positive thing is being able to go to conferences, like travel the world, go to conferences, meet different people. Uh, you know, I, I met a lot of people who I consider my heroes, like, uh, you know, big scientists who were at the very, like, beginning of, of the computer science. You know, I met people like Donald Knut and, uh, you know, other big names uh, who you usually see in the library or in job <laughs> interviews, kind of. Well, uh, Yeah, so it's 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 very it's it's really exciting, like uh, exchanging ideas, meeting with people, collaborating. I feel uh, very energetic when I collaborate with kind of like people who know what they're doing and who are very invested in what they're doing, and it it's it's really really a interesting experience. Well, net networking and getting to know people, and this is something that 
people do not imagine that is your first priority once you get into a PhD. Maybe that is not one of the uh, things that you think y- of, right? Yeah, but surprisingly, fortunately or unfortunately, it's one of the big things that you have to do. Yeah. Because uh, look at it as a job market right now. <laughs> Honestly, yes. And uh, right, I, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts recently and believe it or not, your skills alone do not lend you a job. <laughs> yeah you need connections you need to know people s- right set reality but you know yeah we, of course we, we would love to change that and have it yeah. like a proper meritocracy but we, you know we don't no, really have that's, power that's not that's not the way that it goes mm. okay so, so going back to the bad side to the dark side of your phd <laughs> right? what was like if there was one point that you could remember that was like that was difficult and uh, i mean that generally speaking what what uh, would have been the most difficult part of your phd well, difficult everything <laughs> i mean <laughs> uh it's it's yeah. kind of like I, I was in a relatively like small school so uh getting funding what, what was, school what school were you at uh oh man they're going to hate me for that okay it's a university <laughs> of aizu in fukushima it's what? a very it's what? university of aizu uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I see, in, yeah, in Fukushima, uh, it's it's not a bad school per se, but a lot of problems that are coming is from the way the education is set up here. It, the problem is that, uh, for instance, like getting funding is really tricky. Like, um, just just to give you an example, like, like I after that university, I was a postdoc in Tsukuba, which is a national university, and it was much easier. For like even I was looking on a student level, it was much easier for students to get some kind of support, uh, some kind of funding. We also had some kind of funding on, you know, from the professor on the laboratory side. Uh, so but, did, mm-hmm. let me let me interrupt you. You didn't have your PhD from Tsukuba University? No, no, no. no. I I did my postdoc there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, I, I was I, after for, for some reason I thought you did your postdoc there. Did your PhD there? Sorry. Yeah. At, uh, people. Uh, I mean. I wish I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure if that's any better. Um, this is like one point. Like let, let let me try to like kind of add, go deeper into this point. So, what you said, like that university was small, or like uh, you know, yeah, it's maybe, a small school. Yes, yeah, a small school. So, what what got you to join that university instead of you know a bigger one? Because yeah, I, I remember, um, um, especially for postdoc or for 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 PhD, the, the laboratory that you join is quite important, right? So yeah, I wish I knew that when I did it. You know, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. The thing is, uh, well, it was kind of a funny story. I the when I was kind of finishing my undergrad, I was looking for masters because uh, I kind of had it in my head that. I should probably get a master's. It's a way for me, to, you know, to, to travel the world, like get the international experience. Maybe it's, you know, it's much easier to get a job in, in kind of big tech when you're already abroad because uh, you don't have to, borrow, you know, bother with a visa, this kind of yeah, stuff. No. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's almost like should get a master's abroad. Um, and at the time, I think. Max Scholarship was opening up and I, I saw a post in, in on Russian IT community about that university. And there was a Russian professor. Uh and but I didn't end up working with him. I you know, I just talked to him about it and then I saw that uh, there was another lab that was doing ER research and that was something I was interested in. That was what my undergrad thesis was about. And uh that's kind of like was basically like my passion given my interest in futurism from the early age i was really interested in that exciting new technology it was it was kind of like a a uh, a sort of an exciting time to be in augmented reality because um like a lot of things were made much easier to develop for augmented reality even back then back in 2000 like 2009 2010 11 um so yeah, so I, I applied for that school. Uh, I talked to my prospective advisor. Uh, he was very nice. Uh, yeah, yeah he's, he's still there, I think. Uh, he's still working. Um, he even like wrote me like a recommendation for the embassy, and I applied to the embassy. I 
past. It was really, nice. really, really tough one because uh, out of maybe 50 applicants, only two people passed. Uh, right? Yeah. Was, yeah, Me- one of the- next scholarships are like crazy difficult to get. And like, this is why like people who come with mixed scholarships are usually have kind of Right. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. It's, uh, so uh, that's why I was like, well, it seems to be good. Uh, so I, I went there for masters. Yeah, masters yeah. were not so bad. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> masters were not so bad, and then going into PhD, <laughs> like, it, uh, did you you did not think of changing the lab or like I tried to change the uh, well the lab was not really doable because uh, there were no other labs that were working in on augmented reality at the time um, and I, I tried to change schools but uh, it was really annoying like I I reached out to several universities one of them was Ritsumeikan but they just kind of like they, I sent them my proposal. They said we're not interested. <laughs> uh, I tried to reach out to <laughs> to Tsukuba, and they just ghosted me. Um, oh, yeah. And, and ironically, two years after Ritsumeikan uh, was like giving me their business card, mm-hmm. like, "Hey, nice to meet you. You seem to be really cool." I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> "Now you reach out to me." <laughs> yeah, like, uh, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, Where were you two years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's kind of like I I try to get into other schools, but it's it's really tough if you don't know anyone, uh, and if you kind of can't, it's hard to like even find a proper professor. Like usually, not not all of them are very open to collaboration. Not all of them even answer to your email if you write it in English. You know, so this yeah. is another like I like thing that I I don't know like. Um... How was it for you? But when many, many, many students that I know, many PhD scholars that I know that came to Japan had a problem with, you know, the language barrier. How, how, how was the language barrier? Like, how did it, did it affect your studies? Did it affect your stay? Um, yeah, it's pretty tough. I mean, my advisor is American, so I had no problem working with him. Uh, it's- he okay. speaks English, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, it, and most of the like the university was uh, bilingual, so they they spoke English. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the problem is like, as soon as you get out of university, like nothing speaks English. Like you, you know, I you remember I, I I already told you that joke. Like I I, I call my my Japanese level to be a. Uh, and 7-Eleven. <laughs> <Because, laughs> 7-Eleven. Yeah, because like most of my like yeah. interaction every day is like the, the company stuff or like uh, mm. going to the store. Uh, so yeah, so I, that was like most of my Japanese practice because uh, it's a small town. It's only like what hundred thousand people living there. Most of them are farmers living in like oh. forests. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was that that part was was kind of tough. Uh, also. But even then, like, I'm, I'm come to think of it right now, uh, like job job hunting wise and afterwards, I, I don't think it was such a big, big hurdle. Uh, we, I mean, it, the places who require Japanese were not the places where I would want to work in the first place. So. But, but for example, for your career wise, for example, mm-hmm. um, for your specialization, you don't really need to speak the language that much, right? No, because uh, like most of the research is uh, done in English. I mean, almost all research is done. Of course, Japan has a very strong presence in, in this field of research. That's why partially I'm in Japan because uh, I mean, still in Japan because we, we have like a lot of work being done in this area. Um, even then, this like High, uh, like cutting edge research is usually being published in English because you know the uh, international conferences like from big societies like premier conferences from ACM, IEEE that's where you get your you know that's where you get your H index and all that stuff that you know gets you ahead in academic game so that's why everything is still getting published so you don't need to know a lot of that uh, still does that mean 
like the professors, even the Japanese professors, the laboratories that are like, let's say that have majority Japanese people working on them. Do they also all speak English or no. like? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. You'd yeah. be surprised. Uh, actually, Tokyo University, uh, like I was at a uh, open campus event at Rikimoto Laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody spoke English. One guy who spoke English got angry at me that he had to speak English, as he told afterwards to, to see another guy who stood next to him. Uh, I mean, like, the, when you were speaking, like, yeah, now, now you're making sense because th this is this was my, you know, perception of the situation in here. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of like a lot of uh, laboratories still don't speak a lot of English, but uh, the material. Like they have to publish in English at the end of the day. So right, like yeah. you, you see the final result in English, but before that, it's it's all Japanese. That's true. Okay, so <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy. Like you you know, there's uh, Japan has one of the biggest uh, communities of uh, Microsoft Hololens users. Microsoft what? Uh, Microsoft Hololens is a AR glasses by Microsoft, uh, uh -huh. kind of like a helmet. Uh, and it's they're extremely expensive. They're like was like two thousand or over two thousand dollars for like a headset. Um, and yeah, it's one of the biggest communities is actually in Japan. But so is, there's is, like is it like in but do they? What can I say? But there is a Japanese version probably for them with all the Japanese. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. They translate everything into yeah, Japanese, yeah, they, right? We, like there's a community, the manual search and everything. So there's so much interest that language is, is kind of like not a problem. Like everything's gets translated so people uh, can still get into it here. So you don't need to like learn a lot of English. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> let's go back to your research right now. We kind of drifted off a little bit. So I think you talked to a little bit about it in the beginning but like the applications of your research and of like in the industry now or with what you're doing right now uh, first of all like does your job that you do right now kind of an extension of the research that you did in your phd or not uh yep yeah actually surprisingly so <laughs> Th this I'm is awesome happy. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah like not so many people get to do that but yeah kudos oh it's kind of like uh you know, if if you look at kind of like my research interest as a, like a branching tree, it's it's kind of like it's it's on the it's on the tree, but maybe there's kind of like a bit of a distance between the initial topic and it is my PhD and what I'm doing right now. Uh, so, can you kind of take us a little bit through <laughs> how oh, yeah. does it how does it develop well, from the PhD yeah, so, subject to the? So the thing is, uh, for my PhD, I did like. Augmented, re like mixed reality. Well, let's say augmented reality for the sake of simplicity. Yeah. Um, uh, like remote interaction, <laughs> collaboration, uh, this kind of like interface and interactivity. And during my postdoc, I was working on a grant that combines this topic with the uh, topic of accessibility. Um, we had a kind of like a, uh, a, a JST, it's a J Japan Society for. GSPS is promotion of science GST. I forgot the, what what T stood for. Uh, sorry, GST. But uh, yeah, we had a, a grant uh, that kind of like was talking about how we can combine the kind of cutting edge uh, technologies in uh, interface interactivity, uh, machine learning with uh, different kind of like accessibility things. And I was kind of trying to figure out how, for instance, people with uh, like uh, vision or like vision disabilities or for instance elderly people could uh, use that the this kind of like augmented reality interactions for for collaboration um so uh, let me get this straight you're you were trying to help or to find a way for visually impaired people uh, to in to visually, be part of yeah, visually impaired or hearing impaired, how they can use, for example, augmented reality, because uh, it's an extremely visual medium. Uh, that's something that I've worked on. Um, unfortunately, I didn't 
publish a lot of papers on that because it's it turned out to be a topic more complicated than I expected. And halfway through my postdoc, I started looking for a job. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Cause the, it's, it's, the problem is postdoc contracts in Japan are usually on a yearly basis and so is your visa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like every every December, you're kind of like sitting on your suitcase like... Mm. <laughs> Am is I it time staying to leave? for another year or no? <laughs> yeah, am I going to leave? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I was like, I, I wish I spent more time on this topic, but I, I, and through this work, I got really interested in um, the kind of, they, they, they call it here, uh, they call it here augmented human. Uh, it's, it's it's a bit intense. <laughs> it's the, the question is like, yeah, how, how you can, uh, by using the latest technology, how you can, uh, create sort of like superhuman capabilities for a person or how you can compensate some of the lacking senses or abilities for, for a person when, when it happens. So, for example, um, a, a very famous example of this uh, kind of project would be... Um, Captain America. <laughs> no, 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 Iron, Iron Man, like how to become a real life Iron, Iron Man. Iron Man, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, just a couple of examples off the top of my head is um, maybe like almost yeah, 20 years ago, there was a, oh man, I forgot the name uh, of the project, but there was an idea like how we can um, map your, like, sensory like like map your navigation on your mm. tongue so you could uh <laughs> yeah <What>? so <laughs> basically people could see through their tongues uh like the uh they i i don't remember the full idea but it was something like mm. uh you know your your uh th there's some kind of like brain or technology that uh combines your spatial navigation like the, the part of your brain that works as spatial navigation with the, uh, like, basically with the nerves that go to your tongue or something like that. And you could be able to kind of, uh, if you're blind, you could, you, you, you would be able to kind of create like a spatial map of a room on your tongue and use it as a new kind of sense. I, I know it sounds crazy, but check out Wikipedia. Yeah. It, it's an, it's a yeah. real project. Please, um, please send me like a link. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> sorry, it's not it's not yeah. the best explanation, but uh, so this kind of like ideas is how we can, you know, system use this technology to help people, uh, for example, see when they couldn't see, or how we can people even like go beyond their their abilities, like how we can, you know, we technically can see in ultraviolet. It's just you know our eyes are not really made for that, but it's it's possible to do it, for example, or uh, like. Or for instance, in case with colorblind people, uh, you know, if you use special glasses, you can see the colors. You start seeing, yeah, you start seeing. Yeah, colors, so yeah. this kind of like topics was, was really fascinating for me, I, because you can combine this like cutting edge uh, interactive technology with something that is actually useful and is actually helping you in daily life. So it's kind of going towards being a real life cyborg in, in a way. Yes, so that, that, like, that was that was what what my brain was going. So, like you're basically researching how to make human cyborgs. Yeah, if if you played <laughs> uh, the what was it the famous game uh, Deus Deus X uh, in in the second game, uh, the main character who's a cyborg, he has a famous phrase. He says, "I never ask for this." <laughs> 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 Every time I remember when I'm doing research, like, I can never ask for this. Like, what? Huh. Um, yeah, but yeah. so uh, coming back to my research, uh, so I got interested in that. Uh, so I started digging deeper into uh, the question of like accessibility uh, and kind of like, you know, how, how, how pe people with different forms of disabilities are adapting to, to working with, for example, with mobile phones. Uh, and yeah, I get hired as a consultant uh, at, at the company I'm working at right now. Uh, maybe like it's the beginning of pandemic. And since then, I just got interested in the topic and I stuck around with the team and you now I'm doing uh, research. Don't you work time. for Mercury or like? Yeah. So you work at both these companies at the same time? I don't know. I, I was uh, consulting for Mercury at first as a part, part time academic because. Uh, I still wasn't sure if I want to go into industry, but I figured I want to give it a try. Um, and yeah, and then I kind of like the, the work 
and uh, the team was pretty good. Uh, so yes, yeah, I, I stuck around. Yes, <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, the, the topic is interesting, though. It's it's, it's really, you know, for example, uh, like a lot can depend on what kind of senses you had ever since like you were a child. Like when you, for example, you lost one of your senses. It really changes how your brain perceives and maps information. Uh, for instance, uh, like for uh, for example, even like the fact of like reading for for some blind people who were like born blind, the input output is almost sequential. Like you know, it just it's it's kind of like almost like a computer. Like there's there's no spatial perception, for instance. Uh, so this make that simple a little bit more simple <laughs> okay, what do you uh, mean input and output is instant <laughs> well uh okay so i might be wrong here but i was just it was from one of the uh discussions i had with researchers working this area is uh so depending on how you learn to process the information uh depending on when you lost your uh kind of like you know when you lost your sight for instance it's going to define how you you're able to process the information. For instance, if you have residual vision and you you could like you were able to read before or you were able you know to walk around the room and navigate, you're still going to have that skill to some extent. So for instance, when you're working with people with uh low vision that that's this they, they still have their own vision, they try to uh quite commonly they say, I want to use my eyesight while I still have my eyesight, even though I know my I might lose it in the future, so I want to use it as much as I can. Um but for instance, if a person was born blind, uh, they do not have like this kind of like 3D, uh, visual 3D representation of the world. Uh, so at, at, at times, or at least from what I heard, so I, I, I recommend to, to check out the literature. Now, don't listen to me. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah. For instance, when uh, it's kind of like they, they uh, could, could use text-to-speech at a very like high speeds of reading the text that is is really hard for you to understand for instance but they're used to it um or like yeah i'm, I'm i i i'm i don't want to get into speculation because uh... uh, it's, it's fine but it was, it was very very interesting to you know to 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 get to to hear your you know perspective on on this issue Especially yeah, since you work in something like very close to it yeah it's it's kind of for me it's just the whole idea of how we uh Perceive and work with information is is very fascinating. It's a uh, because you know it even like on you know look at Japanese web design like what the hell is happening like Rakuten. I have no there idea. There needs to like if it's so <laughs> ugly, no... there must be some specifics about the <laughs> something must have been ticking. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, but it's it's like a common thing in in all the like. Not all, but like most of Japanese websites, like they're all like very intense. Like there are a lot of. Oh, well, it's getting getting a little better nowadays. But yeah, it, this is it, this is why I said like not all, but like I think even if you compare it to, I don't know, like five years ago, any Japanese website that you open is just full of yeah, <laughs> full of information a... that just kind of confuses you, right? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, there was a famous uh, video on Twitter where somebody opened like um, Chirashi, like the uh, advertisement on Rakuten. Yeah. And they just start scrolling it, and the scroll was so long they just put like Mario Kart toys on top of it and started playing <laughs> Mario Mario Kart on it. Yeah. Because <laughs> was like a, just like a giant road. <laughs> just... I mean, it's 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 amazing. It's amazing, really. And and the thing is. I'm not trying to shit on <laughs> whatever that they're doing, but in, in in many times I don't know. Like for example, tell me about presentations like that you work oh, with. Oh man, presentations! Like, they're just full of text, right? Oh yeah. Oh, okay, so it's not right? just me. Okay. Yeah. Right? Do, do, <laughs> so do you get nice. like a the, the, it's like a giant block of text that looks like a TV remote manual? Uh, I mean, it's just some. I, I, I I don't get this part, but yeah, uh, it's the exact it's Japan, the exact maybe. opposite of what we learn to do, kind of, right? It's, so it's yeah, it's you you you're trying to process a text and you're like, oh, <laughs> it it kind of 
I mean, definitely this is this goes back to what you said a little bit earlier and people being able to, you know, um, uh, uh, compute information differently, right? So it looks like for Japanese people, they, they're able to analyze text or like they, they get their information through text a lot easier. But at least what I know and what other people that I know talk to is that you should put as little text as possible on the slides. Yeah, that, that's usually and, the idea. Yeah, and then do the other like communication by yourself <laughs> or like explain it, right? So it's, it's a completely different thing. Yeah, it's I, too yeah. many times, too many times, man. I, I, again, I, we, I, I call we, it death by PowerPoint. <laughs> death by PowerPoint. And yeah, anyways, we derailed again from the, <laughs> the subject that we were going in. But again, let's try to go back. Okay, so I think now or before or like, and this thing, like I think everyone who has done research or definitely was done phd postdocs whatever like you get these pits of depression <laughs> or like <laughs> like how about you, the valley <laughs> yeah like you just go down right so my question is like and this is one of the like main questions that i want to ask everybody is that how do you get yourself back up like how do you push through this what what were, what were your strategies you don't i'm, I'm kidding no <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist. No, come on! <laughs> it's such an easy joke. Uh, <laughs> you don't. You just. You just keep it. You. You, you push it down. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. for me, I'm kind of. Uh, I, I I really, as I said earlier, I really like working with uh, community, and it was kind of an unexpected turn of events for me at the end of 2014. Well, like when I was. Finishing my masters, I, you know, I I, I bought myself a mechanical keyboard because I, I really hate like typing long documents. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, oh man, I I hate like writing papers. Like, I, I like doing research, but like typing the whole thing like together. If you don't have a skill for it, and at the time I didn't have a skill, n now at least I I know what to say. Even though I'm still not a super huge fan of it, but at least I know like how to put my words into it. But back then, I like no skill, no interest. I'm like, God damn it, I have to do it. <laughs> uh, so I, bu I bought myself a mechanical keyboard to, to make it a little nicer. And I kind of like plunged into that mechanical keyboard hobby. And at the time, uh, the community there was really amazing. Uh, I, I kind of started hanging out like on international forums. Uh, it was at the time it was a very small community, very tight. Uh, there's like only like a few people who are like super big fans of this thing, and the the, the atmosphere was like super nice. Uh, so that was kind of like my way uh, of like well, one of the ways of like lifting up my spirits is uh, to kind of like uh, engage with these people every day. They kind of became my second family. Uh, I was I really I really enjoyed uh, doing that. Even when I kickstarted that big event in Japan, uh, I was what, like, what, what big event? Oh yeah, so my, my hobby, <laughs> my hobby kept going on, and, yeah. uh, and usually at, at this kind of event, uh, people like to host uh, like mechanical keyboard meetups. Uh, it's you know it's kind of a stupid idea, right? You just like a bunch of people bring their keyboards, they put them on a desk, and you know, just like shake hands or something. Like what? Well, uh, but but it's actually uh, the, first of all the reason for that is because uh, these keyboards are very expensive or very rare uh and i i heard about them yeah. like uh, how how much do they cost on average well now it's much easier to buy them because it's a popular kind of like market because mm -hmm. of people like me who did the community <laughs> work and the promotion and you know yeah. now it's, people want to actually buy it uh it, it can go from like uh the cheapest one is like the sweet spot for the beginners around 100 bucks like 100 dollars but that's not that's not that cheap for a keyboard yes yeah for, for a mechanical keyboard that's cheap <laughs> <laughs> so that's cheap for a mechanical okay so what tell me about a mechanical keyboard what is a mechanical keyboard uh well it's gonna be another hour okay i'll try to push no, it down no no let's try try to try to come <laughs> like well, so the thing is about Let's mechanical keyboards is, uh, like, in Japan, it used to be not 
like it, it was always around it was not a big thing because japan likes electronics you know there's a whole whole uh, history of japan with electronics uh but usually um do, do you know this um like old school keyboards like model m ibm model m all this kind of like stuff that are super like clicky quacky um, oh yeah yeah like they're really big they're kind of clunky uh, yeah. so the thing about them is that uh before uh keyboards are using like membranes uh they uh used to have individual switches and a pcb uh so the thing about that is uh the switches just they feel nice <laughs> like I don't, I don't have any other way to explain <laughs> they it. feel nice they feel nice like just, just to give you an example like uh like there are different types of switches some are more like clicky some of them are like linear which means they're just like super smooth kind of like Putting a hot knife through cold butter smooth this kind of like feeling uh yeah or some of them are like bouncy like typing on a uh you know like uh popping the bubble wrap a very similar feel but except for the like click no, uh, now you're getting me interested in it yeah so there's like a lot of interesting like uh very small tactile sensation uh and sounds uh if you look at youtube uh youtube has a lot of really weird videos it's like your space bar cannot sound this good and you open up and the space bar sounds like it's the best thing ever <laughs> it's like it's just so satisfying you listen really? to it oh, yeah yeah you, you, you know even i like i i'm a seasoned veteran i open like there's no way what it's so stupid like, why am i like this is this is this is the keyboard that i have you must be so disappointed oh man i got a bunch <laughs> of them like uh wait which is the best sounding space bar i have oh geez i don't know i don't i don't have the best sounding space bar around here i have a i have like six keyboards around me right now but i, I don't want to like, dig up yeah um hmm. yeah, i i used to have more uh, and, and you make them yourselves, right? You're some, yourself. of, some of them I make myself, some of them I, I purchase pre built. Anyway, so that hobby is just like kind of gives you a very interesting tactile sensation uh, when you're typing. And, you know, as a programmer, you type, there's also a lot of other things like you can customize the layout. So it would be like the most convenient thing for you ever. Uh, you, you can um, like customize the color, uh, the like ergonomics, all this kind of stuff. Uh, that it's really not a bad money investment if you spend out of you know time programming on a keyboard because you know your carpal tunnel syndrome <laughs> is very hard to treat <laughs> so putting a bit of money into it is, is kind of like worth the time um so yeah so there's like a kind of like a hobby around it usually it used to be like uh either like super hobbies like me or like esports kind of like cyber sports people because for cyber sports obviously you need to like like optimize the time it takes you to click a button because it could <laughs> yes, be yes. Uh, you know it the could difference take between you. winning or losing yeah it's like uh, yeah. the uh was his response time is like in milliseconds something it's yeah. like crazy crazy um for, for us we we're just like oh it sounds nice it's kind of cool it's uh, <laughs> it's, uh yeah it's yeah. very expensive it's the uh, most beautiful sound of the space bar yeah, well, I mean, uh, just to give you a few examples, oh, geez, all right, with me, with me. Okay. I, don't know, I, I have a microphone here, so it probably should sound nice. Like, here's one of my favorites. I build it myself. How about this? Sounds nice. You built this yourself? Yeah, well, it's it's a kit, so I, I didn't design it from scratch. Uh, but nice, it's, it sounds nice. Okay, so here's top ray. Here's a muted top ray. Oh, I love this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, see, this, see? This, yeah, I'm yeah, converting the... you. All right, hold on. There is, this, one, this one sounds better. Here's another one. This one. Okay, can you do this and the one before it? Uh, okay, okay, hold up. Uh. <laughs> uh, wait, I have so another one. Suddenly, I can't hear it. Wait, I have another one. Hold on. Oh, okay. Jesus Christ. Uh, wait. <laughs> How about this? I don't know. Like suddenly, the the, the 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 audio doesn't come out as as before. Like I don't know, but oh no! I, 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 Zoom I, figured out the uh, oh the yeah, noise of probably, my keyboard. Yes, probably it's canceling. Right, them how out. do yeah. I turn off the noise suppression? Uh, uh, well, I don't know how to. Eh, it's fine. We'll, we'll eh. do it on another time. But yeah, I get All it. Right. Yeah, so there's like a whole community around it, and uh, we used to do like meetups uh, because. 
very expensive. It's a quick way to check out different keyboards, different builds, uh, meet new people. You know, sometimes like you want to, let's say, make a new keyboard, but you don't know how to like uh, cut, cut, you know, do like the computer uh, assisted design. Like you don't know how to make a 3D model, for instance. You meet a person and you work together, you know, you get something working. So well, this is like regular community stuff. Uh, so I started that in Japan around 2016. We started with a small group of maybe 30 people and we grew to like 2000 people online and uh, 100 people on site in the last meetup in 2019. Um, and yeah, it was, was kind of like a big, big work for me, but I was very happy. Or at the end of the day, like people told me, like, "Hey, thank you so much for hosting it. I had so much fun. Uh, I thought it's going to be a, you know, at first I was like, they told me at first I was nervous to bring my keyboard along around people I don't know, but it's been so much fun. So thank you so much for always doing this work. And I was, I was like the best, the best feeling ever when people were telling you that they're like, uh, honestly, honestly, uh, appreciate your work. Um, yeah, and I, I also went to like I, I'm a musician. I, I went to like a bunch of live shows. Uh, like I, I like you know heavy metal, experimental music kind of stuff. So I've been also going like uh, in in Japan. There's a very, very like a small tight knit community of musicians. So when you go to the show, you sometimes you get to hang around with somebody really famous. Uh, so it's 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 been super fun. I uh, made a lot of new friends. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, also, you, you, I had to go to Tokyo most of the time because, you know, nobody goes to Fukushima. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, that was the during the time that you were in Fukushima, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. That, so I had to how long does to it take from Fukushima to Tokyo? On a bus, like four and a half hours, I guess. One way. So, so it's not that bad. I mean, it's not, no, know, not it's that not, bad. It's not awesome, but it's not that bad. Either. It's not that bad, but the, uh, the climate difference is very like noticeable uh especially winter it's really? very windy because it's in the mountains uh we have like a lot of uh, snow uh yeah. probably like two meters of snow or something like that uh wow. <laughs> yeah I, 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 so I got winters over you. there suck yeah yeah like uh somebody uh like the city made uh like uh uh you know uh, the drains for the rain on on the road and they they put them into the into the uh you know the, the walkway like the, the the pedestrian walkway during winter uh the snow goes everywhere but when it goes over that drain uh it's less dense than everywhere else so it works like you know that vietnam war pit with uh <laughs> Oh, oh! I see. So people kind of like fall. Yeah, you go in and your leg falls in, and you and because there's so much <laughs> snow, you know, it's it's almost the size of your leg. I like I felt like I almost broke my leg, and there was like so. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, uh, thank wow. God I didn't pay city tax back then. Otherwise, I would have complained. <laughs> like, what? What are you spending my taxes on? Jesus Christ! Oh, tax payment in here. Like, there's so many frustrating things, but you know, we just gotta do what we gotta do. Mm. anyways so yeah i mean we're almost at the end of our of the podcast so what one one more one one last question and then i'll i'll let you <laughs> let you go to sleep it's already a little bit late so uh if anybody is interested in you know joining a phd program or continuing you know into stem kind of specializations uh what would be <laughs> the one advice that you would give to them um well uh, I, other I, other than don't do it <laughs> so, so. <laughs> well i actually do consult a lot of students about phd uh okay. as part of my volunteering work nice uh yeah because i don't want people to be like me like oh i don't have a plan um <laughs> mm. yeah i gotta think about like my my first usually like my first advice for people who want to do a phd is like do you see yourself as being a researcher like maybe five ten years on like do you really see yourself putting so much time to this career when you have other opportunities for, which are could be more lucrative uh you know could bring you more money and people really need to consider that um yeah but if if you really want to 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 do something like that it's uh, then there's like a lot of ways to do that. There's like a lot of actually materials on how to do a PhD, how to find a lab and all this stuff. So I, I recommend checking it out first. 
So <laughs> your one thing to ask them is that do you really see yourself as a researcher five or ten years from now? Well, it's kind of like, yeah, do, do you like feel like you want to, uh, at least within the nearest future, do you see your career being like in research or academia roles? Because realistically, once you get a PhD, if you get a PhD, uh, <laughs> if you get uh, once, once you get That's a... That's dark. Yeah. Once you get a PhD, it's kind of like most of the like options would be there for you that are would have been research uh because you know if you go back to industry with a phd it's it's getting like a bit hard to get hired if you try to go back just being a software engineer um because people will be like you're too expensive like why i can't exactly right though i, I can hire an undergrad that does the same thing and <laughs> less less of an attitude you know I mean, this is one of the things with PhD graduates. So it's the the the, uh, the job market is a lot more competitive. It's not easy to land a job anymore. Uh, true, it's hard to get tenure, uh, hard to land a job. Uh, but at the same time, it depending on your area of work. Like for instance, machine learning, it's becoming really crazy. But at the same time, a lot of uh, like in auto positions, PhD is a big plus. Like, uh, because machine learning, people don't understand it very well <laughs> still. So they kind of like, oh, you know, to, to, to be ahead of the technological competition, you kind of need to uh, be able to constantly read all these like thousands of papers that are coming out every day. So if you don't have like academic background, you're going to be just behind your competition. And by academic background, you mean like a PhD? Not just not just uh, masters or the masters is also doable like masters or undergrad really but usually uh like a degree wins basically like if you have uh you know a PhD or like a diploma from a good school or like all this kind of stuff that let's say I have a certificate that says that I'm good uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I have, I have yeah. a document. <laughs> For that, so <laughs> it says I'm really good. Yeah, you know, there, there's a, yeah. a famous um, blog post uh, about like making it in machine learning as an independent researcher a few years ago, and it's really, really hard. I, I saw how like one guy tried to do it. He managed to do it, but it was really like an uphill battle. So, uh, and I think at the end of it, at the end of the day, he ended up joining some lab to, to continue his work. Why don't, I don't know if my friend does machine learning. I have a, my friend is a dentist ah. that uh, became interested in data science. Mm -hmm. And right now he works for Philips. I want to invite him in this podcast, but the dude is just giving me a hard time because he's a that shy type of person. Uh. But uh, that's what he, I think that, I don't know if that's machine learning that he does, but he basically analyzes, you know, images using you know computer I know. vision i don't know if it's called computer vision deep learning and i don't know stuff like that so Im he, image processing image processing that's the word mm -hmm. he does image processing using i don't know he uses python and all kinds of softwares to analyze images and basically detect patterns in them and trying to diagnose diseases using Ah, okay. AI to okay, figure that, out this pattern. It's a popular, you know? popular direction, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know, like, I, I <laughs> unfortunately, is a very shy dude, but I'm gonna get him here. <laughs> yeah, it's one way uh, or the other. It's kind of, it's, it's very popular, uh, very competitive. Uh, I, I myself consider like getting into it a little bit, uh, just out of curiosity. It's it's really fascinating where AI is going to take us, but job perspective wise is oof. Job is, uh, it's very difficult. It's difficult, but it pays a lot. So it's kind of like you know, like playing in a casino. <laughs> <It's kind of laughs> like, yeah, like it's 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 hard to get, but if you if you get it right, you're gonna be like you're gonna be good. It's gonna be rewarding. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely. Uh, and for somebody that is interested in this field, you do recommend that they join a postgraduate program and not just try to do it by themselves. Well, in AR, VR, uh, I mean, you can get in on the industry site, even like with uh, 
without a degree really like it right now it's, it's getting much easier because uh companies are putting a lot of uh money into education uh into like educating future people who are going to use their product and promote their product etc so if you look at you know like unity uh is the most popular game engine like even people in high school oh, can yeah, use yeah, it yeah 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 it's yeah it's amazing yeah i saw it <laughs> yeah so the, it, it's getting much easier so if you just want to develop something you don't really need a degree uh but if you want to do something scientific about it uh like for example if you're passionate about some research topic and or if you want to get deep into it or maybe you see doing some kind of interesting like academic work in the future yeah mm -hmm. by all means uh, go ahead and apply for the program uh but it it, it really depends like uh you, you kind of like check out the job postings i don't know the famous laboratories <laughs> the, the research the conferences and, and see what what works best for you so yes don't jump immediately into a program or something but review your options see the job prospect pros yeah, the prospects right. of a career afterwards then yeah you usually right it's it's kind of like uh it's a big time commitment so consider like uh you know consider your time as your money and kind of try to do like a kind of like opportunity cost analysis of sorts where you, you kind of think like okay if i you know if i wor work like 80 hours on this a week 80 hours well <laughs> uh okay 40 to 90 hours a week how many hours is it in total in a week? And I was like, uh, honestly, I don't. At, at, okay, at least seventy to eighty hours. I know if you're gonna work ten hours a day. Uh, yes. This is embarrassing. I'm trying to calculate twenty four. <laughs> I think it's ninety six hours. One hundred sixty eight hours. Okay, so eighty hours is doable. All right, so eighty hours. <laughs> eight, yeah, in, yeah. Instead of like actually earning money. Uh, so you kind of need to ask yourself, like, okay, in in three to five years, do I want to be like, do, do I want to have some kind of savings and I want to like earn some money, or maybe I I want to sacrifice my comfort and my financial stability for now, for a possible <laughs> financial instability <laughs> in the future, no, for for a possible reward in the future, and that kind of you need to you need to consider it for yourself. Yeah, so this is like it really depends on on the person and everyone like with their own yeah, way of thinking. Because for example, like for people who have families, uh, it's it's hard to do a PhD. Like, you, I, I I cannot oh, yeah. imagine how how like people, even if if your PhD is paid, uh, how you can support like a family. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not an easy process. Believe me, I know <laughs> I know about it. So, okay, okay, thank you. It's, I, I think we've been more than an hour. Dude, oh, yes. talk, talk, talking to you is amazing. Like, time flies without me, you know. I appreciate it. Uh, we should yeah. catch up sometime as well. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I mean, uh, this is like, I don't know, this is just a few episodes in in the podcast. I'm, I think I want to continue to do this for a while and I'm probably going to, interview him again for like some updates about the projects that you're working on so thank you thank you for much very much for being here today yep thank you uh if you have anything feel free to reach out i'm i'm gonna put your contacts if you don't mind in the yep. podcast description if somebody is interested if someone hears this podcast and they become interested in your like it may be in your kind of uh, work so they would be able to contact you Yep, then no, no problem with that. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Okay, bye-bye.